for today's session, we're joined by two of our faculty fellows, Tony Putifat from Lakehead University and Lynn Balker from University of Ottawa. And we are lucky to have Richard Hornsey from York University to moderate today's discussion. Between 2005 and 2018, Richard played a leading role in the establishment of the Lausanne School of Engineering at York University. From small beginnings in the Faculty of Pure and Applied Science, the school has now grown into an independent faculty with nearly 4,000 students, 130 faculty, and 60 staff. Um, and Lausanne's Renaissance concept aims to educate engineers and scientists to tackle complex societal issues from a broad perspective. Richard is particularly interested in student transfer pathways because of their role in achieving a mix of students in Lausanne's programs to support and encourage these broad perspectives. Uh, so with that, I'd like to hand it off to Richard to get the session started. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, inaugural OnCat podcast. Um, so uh, this afternoon, we have a, a panel discussion with uh, two of our three panelists, um, Lynn Bowker and uh, Anthony or Tony uh, Padifat. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Richard Hurley was unable to join us at the last moment due to a family emergency, but will hopefully rejoin us partway through, um, in which case we will uh, blend him in seamlessly uh, into the conversation. So uh, we have um, a set of uh, questions for our panelists, which we think will take around 30 minutes of our 45 minutes of time, um, leaving some time for questions from uh, you are audience, um, and uh, uh, then I will summarize at the end um, and uh, remark that the, um, there will be a, the college panel happening uh, next week as well. So uh, to kick us off, um, I would like to ask each of the panelists, um, what inspired you to take on um, an ONCAT project? Um, and uh, what is the intervention that your project brings? And in, as part of that, if you could also sort of identify uh, what it is you do um, in, your, in your position, that would be helpful too. So maybe we'll start with uh, Lynn uh, to talk about what inspired you to take on the project. Thank you, Richard. Yes, uh, so I'm Lynn. I'm a professor at the School of Translation and Interpretation at the University of Ottawa. But prior to be, be returning to my professor life, I was actually the vice dean of the faculty. And in that capacity, uh, one of my main responsibilities was to oversee the cyclical reviews of academic programs, sort of the quality assurance process that takes place. And while I was in that role, I got to sort of get an overview of all the different programs. And I observed that although there are hundreds of programs here at the University of Ottawa, we have only a handful of articulation agreements. And so I was wondering, you know, why? Why are there so few? Are there any barriers? Are there any obstacles getting in the way of developing articulation agreements and promoting transfer from colleges to universities? So for this project, I uh, undertook, first of all, a literature review to see if I could find out uh, what faculty at universities were thinking, if they had uh, identified any obstacles. And then after the literature review, I followed that up with a survey and a series of follow-up interviews with professors here at the University of Ottawa. I managed to talk to professors in eight of our nine faculties, so I got a really nice cross-section of uh, different types of programs here in different disciplines. And one of the things that came out of my study was that uh, transfer seems to have a relatively low visibility here on campus. Uh, some of the professors that I talked to had not really heard of it, didn't totally understand what it was, and uh, in some cases didn't even realize that they could potentially initiate discussions about articulation agreements rather than you know, waiting to be approached by a college. 
So one of the outcomes of this project uh, has been really a sort of mini awareness campaign, I guess I could describe it, and uh, the creation of a, a sort of faculty resource kit sort of handing faculty uh, a sort of, uh, you know, one pager or in this case a three pager about, you know, what transfer is, uh, how they could get it started, who the key contacts are, what, what are the main things to know about it. So that's sort of a, a high level summary of what I've been working on for the past uh, six months or so. That's great. Thank you. Um, I, I have to say that I would echo the same kind of sentiment that uh, most of my regular faculty members um, and faculty colleagues um, have little awareness of this. Um, how about you, Tony? How did, uh, how did you get involved and uh, what was your project? Thanks. Uh, well, last year I was invited to be a part of some meetings that were taking place between uh, Confederation College. I'm in Thunder Bay at Lakehead University. I guess I'm the chair of uh, the sociology department here. And um, so I just sort of randomly asked to join in on a, a set of meetings that were organized. I think it might have been funded by ONCAT last year, too, um, but I wasn't really part of that side of it, so I'm not sure. Um, but we basically met with uh, the Confederation College people and just sat around the table over lunch, basically, for a few hours chatting about possibilities for transfer agreements, uh, both from Confederation College over to Lakehead University and uh, in the other direction, Lakehead University over to Confederation College. So we thought that both uh, pathways might be beneficial for the students. And the more we talked, the more the possibilities seemed to open up and uh, a lot of sort of potential and good uh, sentiments were definitely generated there. So then I was asked to go ahead and do this uh, more recent project um, since I had some experience um, in meeting about the transfer agreements from the year previous. And um, the basic point of this project was to focus just on the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities in, uh, in our university and look for um, basically ways to educate people about uh, the pathways, sort of echoing some of the things Lynn said. Um, and so we had uh, several meetings and workshops to to talk to uh, the faculty. Um, we participated at some of the faculty councils in providing some information and so forth. And um, just getting people educated about um, what transfer agreements are and uh, how we might go about them. Um, Andrew Hepner was working with me, and he was sort of the data cruncher and uh, did a lot of the actual nitty-gritty work. And he did this great data report that basically looks at all the different transfer students from Confederation College into Lakehead and uh, kind of maps it graphically. So it's fairly easy for people to see where the major flows are. And then based on where the flows were, we figured let's take a look at those agreements and see if we can make them better, improve them, or generate them if they're not currently there, right? So one of the ones we were very excited about was uh, a diploma that they are earning at Confederation College called um, Aboriginal Community Advocacy. Um, and we have uh, a strong impetus to try and attract um, First Nations students uh, more and more make things more accessible and create pathways out of high school but also out of the college for uh, Indigenous students. So this seemed like a good way to go uh, for that and also because there did seem to be a, a fairly good flow of students from there into some of our departments, notably uh, political science, sociology, and Indigenous learning. So we worked very hard on that and um, basically negotiated the terms and tried to figure out what the right amount of credit would be uh, to give somebody who has earned their two-year diploma from Confederation College in that field and what kinds of courses we could give. So a bit of give and take between the different chairs of the different departments and a few meetings were required to iron those uh, agreements out. And then we were able to pass those and take it to Senate uh, that's basically approved now. It's just going through the, the final uh, quality control committees and stuff at the, at the tail end. And a lot of other useful conversations were started um, in terms of other possible transfers. So police foundations and the political science 
uh, film production into English, for example. And sociology is looking at uh, welcoming uh, nursing, social service workers, and things like that in, uh, because we do have a focus on health, but sometimes people don't think of sociology as the first stop to study uh, health policy issues and stuff. So uh, we were hoping to highlight that as a, as a potential pathway as well. But uh, basically, it was just educating people on the two campuses. We have our, our main campus in Thunder Bay, and we also have a satellite campus in Aurelia. And uh, they have Georgian College next to them, so we're also starting to look into possible pathways between Georgian and um, and Aurelia uh, uh, programming as well. So that's pretty much the long and short of it, I guess. Bonnie, I'm really okay. excited to hear that you are having such success getting programs up and running in the humanities and social sciences. One of the things that I noticed is that of the few programs we do have here at the University of Ottawa, they're mostly in engineering um, and health sciences, and there hasn't been a lot of activity in the humanities and social sciences. So I'm really excited to hear that you've managed to get some traction on that, and I hope we can uh, follow your lead. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think uh, people are pretty open to it. There's different opinions out there about transfers, you know, and how much credit should be given and um, if it can be considered uh, the relevant experience and things. Uh, unfortunately, one of the panelists uh, who's not here, Richard, uh, was, I guess, looking at some of these issues. I shouldn't talk about his project, but um, he was making the, the point that in studying the success rates of many of the transfer students, they actually end up doing a lot better than uh, students that didn't get uh, through on a transfer. So the fear that uh, somehow people aren't being properly prepared uh, for university through the college streams and therefore won't perform adequately is sort of unfounded based on his research at least. That's also really encouraging because it definitely is a fear um, for the people that I interviewed um, uh, and asked them, you know, what were some of the obstacles? Why had they not pursued any articulation or pathway agreements? One of the big concerns that came up repeatedly was that they weren't really sure that the students who arrived from college would be able to keep up or would be, you know, kind of at ease in the university classroom. So I'm really uh, happy to hear that um, you know, while it could be uh, definitely a, a concern, it's a concern that can be countered with some empirical evidence that demonstrates that, that that's not really necessarily the case. I think another important point is there's a there's a big diversity of students that we're dealing with all the time. Somebody mentioned that the last time we talked about, um, you know, international students with language issues and uh, students who are first-time university goers and you know, all sorts of different um, challenges that we, we have in the classroom. And uh, really, uh, university professors are expected nowadays to do, a, you know, a bit of extra work in um, uh, trying to get people uh, up to speed. So if somebody's less experienced in the university context, uh, it certainly wouldn't be new terrain for most profs. And, um, in the contemporary I agree. period. Yeah, I agree. Our classes are pretty diverse already, and getting more so, I think, as we uh, see more and more interdisciplinary programs coming on stream. So, so you've mentioned some of the um, uh, um, some of some of your experiences. Um, I'm just wondering whether there were any uh, particular roadblocks, or, or conversely, any any pleasant surprises um, that you uh, encountered. Um, really to prepare others for following in your in your footsteps because it sounds like in each of your institutions um, you're one of the, the pioneers of the of, of advocacy for transfers so um, if somebody was interested in in um, being an advocate in their own institution um, what what would you alert them to look out for uh, both positive and negative uh, maybe start with uh, Tony start with a positive. I guess the uh, unexpected pleasantry or pleasantness would be um, some people having prior knowledge of transfer agreements. Um, so LACAT does have some transfer agreements established uh, beforehand. Um, but 
they're not necessarily consistent and not everybody has them. And um, there are many instances where the students will have to just informally figure out what kind of transfer credit they get. So it sort of depends what chair they're talking to or what um, uh, assessment officer they're dealing with at the university kind of thing. So um, it seems a bit unequal uh, at times. But the, the positive side of it was a lot of people didn't need to be educated right from scratch, that some people did have uh, more awareness of others. Certainly not all. Many people hadn't got a clue what we were talking about, even with the term, and had to be uh, more educated about it. And the tough part was probably just the nitty-gritty, the ironing out of the specifics of the agreements. Um, I think in terms of the information, everybody was very interested in it, and I think it didn't take a lot of selling to get people uh, to see that this is an important thing to do and an important initiative to take, basically for fairness, you know, to make sure you're treating each uh, student that's coming in from a college program uh, as equitably as possible in relation to each other and make sure that they get credit for uh, for what they have done and what they bring in to the university when they start. So I think on that level, there's a lot of buy-in. People are mainly arguing about the finer points. How many FCEs, full course equivalents, do we give for two years? Do we do two and two? Is two years equivalent to two years in university? Is it equivalent to one year? Is it equivalent to one and a half years? So uh, some of those numbers had to be adjusted in order to get departments to sign on, um, basically according to their own uh, beliefs of what uh, what ought to be required. Uh, all programs are different, of course, so uh, a one-size-fits-all model probably wouldn't work because um, you, you cannot get all the departments to agree on the exact number of courses and things like that. So that would probably be the, um, the toughest obstacle, but I, I think that just... Um, Showing people that there are, I think gathering data is important in terms of trying to figure out how big of an issue this is, how big are the flows, you know, how many students are actually transferring. And if people see that there are actually fairly, you know, not insignificant numbers of students coming through and do represent a pretty significant stream of revenue, then it does make sense to probably um, set up a system that uh, welcomes them uh, more easily. And I think as long as it's communicated in that way, and not only making things easier and saving people money and time, but also being fair across the board um, and not treating each student on an individual basis, but um, in a kind of fair, measured, systematic way, then I think people uh, sort of gravitate to that. Great. Um, Lynn, would, would you have a particular piece of advice stemming from your experience of roadblocks or surprises? Pleasant surprises? Yeah, well, I can echo some of Tony's experience. I was very pleasantly surprised by the openness and willingness of faculty to engage with the, the questions surrounding transfer. Um, as I mentioned, it didn't have a particularly high visibility, but when I approached people to participate, I got what I, I was really pleased with the response rate and with the kind of you know willingness of people to to kind of engage in the discussion. So I thought that was very positive. Um, in terms of roadblocks. Um, one of the things that uh, we discovered was that uh, here at the University of Ottawa, we didn't have a nice kind of centralized place where people could go for information. Information was there, but it was kind of scattered around a little bit here, a little bit there. So one of the things that we're trying to do is kind of pull those uh, pieces of information together in a sort of centralized resource, uh, put it up on our web so that people who are interested in taking this to the next step have a place to start rather than kind of having to forage around and, and you know, everyone kind of um, doing their own hunting and gathering. So um, that, that's something that I think will hopefully make it easier uh, moving forward. If I could offer some advice, um, I would agree definitely with Tony's observation that there are different disciplinary cultures, so a one-size uh, solution might not fit everyone. Um, and uh, something that came up several times when I was speaking with faculty here was that to really set uh, an articulated program up for success, 
there has to be departmental buy-in. It can't be a sort of pet project of one or two faculty members because if those uh, champions sort of move on or take on a new project, then the program may founder and uh, that's just sort of like disappointing for everyone. So definitely make sure there's departmental buy-in beyond just one or two champions before moving ahead to set up a program. Um, well, the other thing is uh, I had this Andrew Hepner fellow help me, and he's an excellent institutional uh, analyst, I guess would be the best title for him, but he's very good at crunching numbers and uh, getting the nitty-gritty, the details down, pinned down. And these articulation agreements can be a bit tedious, um, and faculty, with all the different things that we have to do, are often not uh, great at um, this side of the work. So I think that when designing a kind of initiative, um, probably setting budget aside for somebody who's very dedicated to uh, data management skills and, and things like that to help on the side, fully dedicated, um, is a great way to move forward quickly. Just basically to help people. I mean, you can tell a department, hey, you should do an articulation agreement, here's the guidelines, here's the rules, here's a template, here's a sample, uh, but then they've got to do it, right? And so they may do it, or they may not do it, but if you have somebody who's actually going to do the work, draw it up for them, consult with them, you know, meet with them as often as possible, as necessary, and get, get the, the, the I's dotted and the T's crossed to make sure that things actually get done, um, that's mm -hmm. extremely helpful. And I just think faculty with the going concerns and their interests, many many aren't going to have the attention span or the um, uh, the time, basically, uh, to to be able to uh, necessarily deliver. Yeah, I could follow up on that with a, a couple of points uh, to support what uh, Tony just said. Uh, definitely the question of workload was something that came up as a concern and as a barrier for many of the faculty. Even if they were interested, even if they had goodwill, um, they were a little bit concerned about having to add this on top of their other duties. So I think definitely having support, whether it's in the form of an institutional analyst or some other type of support uh, would be very welcome and would actually move the process forward beyond a, a goodwill stage into actual kind of action. Um, and similarly, when I asked uh, what other type of support uh, faculty might benefit from, they said it could also be useful to have more institutional support for marketing and recruitment. That faculty would be good at designing the program, but that they don't have either the time or the expertise to make sure that um, you know the seats get filled at the end of the day, and that is very disappointing to have put uh, you know a lot of work into developing uh, an articulation agreement and then to have relatively low uptake by transfer students. So they felt that um, universities could support them more perhaps with the marketing and recruitment, not to kick it over to the colleges exclusively, though certainly they would also be welcome to promote the programs, but that um, you know the marketing departments rather than the professors themselves could take on uh, some of, of those duties. So following up on those points, often the um, the university, the institution's um, sort of approach to transfers is is a strategic one for the institution as a whole, as well as important at the department levels. And you, you illustrated a number of uh, places where support might be needed. Um, but what is the role of uh, administrative leaders, I'm thinking of deans, provosts and so on um, in helping facilitate the work at the at the ground level. Uh, maybe I'll start with Lynn. Well, I think just knowing that there's institutional support would go a long way. Um, you know, sometimes I think the faculty members feel that they are, um, you know, doing a project and they're not really sure if it's in alignment with some of the kind of institutional directions. And so I think even just a little bit more dialogue, having 
um, just recognition of the work that they're doing, um, you know, having just sort of moral support would actually go a long way, as well as some of the more practical uh, types of support that Tony and I have just mentioned, um, you know, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, having, uh, yeah, just a, a sort of recognition on the, on the website, this is a great program, or uh, tweeting about it, or whatever. I think just to, uh, recognizing that there is work that goes into developing it, and, um, you know, that the work is appreciated by the institution as a whole, and not uh, seen as just a, a little departmental activity. Yeah, I agree with all of that uh, for sure. Um, I was sort of lucky. Our our deputy provost, uh, Nancy Luca is her name. She's very um, interested in this and sees it as a very important strategic thing for lay kids. And so I sort of had to get my arm twisted to get involved in this uh, in the first place. And now I understand it now that I've become a bit more educated about the whole thing. And I see the value in it, um, but if it wasn't for her leadership and um, her enthusiasm, you know, I probably wouldn't have done it. So she was a great uh, help as an administrative leader, for sure. And our own dean, uh, Betsy Birmingham, has been really enthusiastic about this project all along as well and has uh, provided some supporting funds and... Um, definitely gave us a place at the table at faculty council um, on more than one occasion to, to talk about these things and encourage people to come into the workshops and everything else. So I think that uh, I really couldn't ask for more uh, support. Um, and it doesn't need to be a lot. I don't think it, it asks a lot, but it just, as Lynn was saying, it, it has to be a positive attitude. There has to be enthusiasm. There has to be forward thinking. And a little bit of... Um, cheerleading perhaps just to get people uh, like myself uh, interested and engaged. Another thing I think is because uh, some of the more central administrators have uh, an overview of, of what's happening elsewhere on campus, you know, sometimes professors are aware of what's happening in their own department, maybe in their own faculty, but I think there's a lot that people can learn from talking to those who've gone through the experience in other faculties or other departments. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the existing agreements here at the University of Ottawa tend to be largely in engineering and health sciences, but if we wanted to get something moving in humanities or social science, I think we could still learn a lot from our colleagues in, you know, in um, the other faculties. And uh, someone who's at a higher level or more central uh, position would be able to put people in touch and get conversations going outside of the department or, or faculty boundaries, if you like. So I, I think that could be another um, role that uh, that uh, academic leaders could play. Right. I think uh, yeah, also I just to say that the faculty level is a good uh, strategy. I think it worked well in our case. Like we we. We just wanted to we wanted to bite off more than a department, but not the entire university. <laughs> and the faculty allowed a lot of departments to see common diploma programs that would serve them each equally well, and it allowed for a lot of joint agreements to to, to be fostered in ways that it probably wouldn't be as possible across the faculties as much. Although it's useful to learn from what other faculties are doing, certainly, and administrators can help build those connections, but. Um, I just want to say that as advice, maybe in the previous question, uh, maybe faculty-led initiatives with the dean playing a central role, administrative role, would be um, would perhaps be a good model to follow. I don't know. Great, thank you. Um, speaking of faculty, then, um, how, how could, how, in what ways can faculty uh, um, who interact with the students? Um, and uh, are subject matter experts in their programs. How can how can they? Uh, what roles do they play in the transfer, and how uh, can those be enhanced? Um, Tony. Uh, well, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, the problem is I don't know how much faculty necessarily know. Um, so you'll get a course roster of students, but you wouldn't necessarily know which ones are transfer students unless they tell you. Interestingly, I had a transfer student in uh, my theory class this past year, and she was um, 
definitely communicating to me that it was quite a leap from uh, college to university in terms of the reading and uh, the level of reading comprehension that's required sort of thing in order to um, move along with the requirements. And so she was feeling quite stressed out. Uh, but she uh, got better as the term progressed and, and definitely communicated that um, that you know, me bearing with her, it allowed her to sort of start uh, getting uh, more comfortable with the, with the new expectations. So uh, I think that maybe, I don't know, it's, hard, it's a tough question. Like I said, I don't have a perfect answer, but I would say that a kind of openness and um, a bit of patience and a bit of slack and um, a little bit of extra help and instruction um, for people who are coming into university uh, for the first time, midstream uh, is definitely uh, a must. But identifying the students is still a problem because if they don't yeah, self-identify, I, I don't know how the profs can figure it out. So I agree with Tony. There certainly uh, our class lists don't give any indication of students who have come from different programs or different backgrounds. So unless the student self-identified, it would be hard to. Um, know who they were. Um, although one of the things that I'm uh, recommending as part of this faculty resource kit that we're putting together, on the one hand there are resources for faculty, but uh, on the other hand we've put together a list of services that are already offered here on campus um, that we think might be good to support uh, transfer students. Not only transfer students, they are there to support all students, but there are particular uh, workshops offered by our library, for example, or the Student Peer Mentoring Center. So we've put together a list of, um, of resources that faculty can offer to students. So if a student were to self-identify and, you know, have an interest in maybe getting a little bit of extra support or help, the faculty would have at the ready a uh, kind of list of, of services that are already available on campus uh, that might benefit uh, students in a transfer uh, situation. Oh, great ideas. Good. Well, thank you both very, very much. I think uh, looking at the time, it, it maybe now uh, is an opportunity to uh, ask other people on the line if they have any questions uh, for our panelists. Um, if you do, um, I'd ask that you please identify yourself and, and where you're from um, before um, jumping in with your question. Hi, hi, Richard. Hi, everybody. It's Yvette Monroe. I'm the Executive Director uh, of Allgat. Thank you, first of all, to our faculty fellows uh, for the project you're doing, and, and thank you, Richard, for being the moderator. Um, I do have a question, um, and I would love your thoughts, actually all three of you, your thoughts on this. And the question is, what do you think um, ONCAT's role can be, particularly in terms of engaging or supporting faculty uh, more broadly than, than beyond kind of the faculty fellows project? Um, uh, to engage and support faculty members across, you know, in colleges and universities over the uh, throughout the province. What would, what might be some of your suggestions in terms of what ONCAT could start doing or do more of? Um, well, if I could start, uh, this is great. I hadn't really thought about this side of things until this conversation. Um, but I think one thing is we have all sorts of supports in place for international students, indigenous students, and um, students with uh, various um, uh, special needs uh, and so forth. Um, would it be so difficult to build a branch as a subset of some of those services that deals with uh, transfer students specifically? You know, So something like that might be worthwhile. Um, I don't know if it's cost effective or whatever, but I think that probably a, a place somebody could go to ask for help in that specific uh, with that specific set of needs that doesn't quite fall into the other helping categories uh, might be useful, as well as being directed, uh, you know, to all the other services Lynn uh, Lynn mentioned. 
I think that's a great suggestion, Tony. I can see a place right here at Ottawa U where that would fit perfectly. It's called the Student Academic Success Service, and they do have various sub-branches, as you've mentioned, international students, um, students who might need academic accommodation, and to have, uh, you know, at least one kind of resource person there who is very familiar with the transfer situation uh, would be, I think, a really great addition to that. Um, I'm also going to uh, say kudos to ONCAC, something that I have found very useful throughout my project and I think is a great resource and that you should keep building on is the glossary that you have because part of the challenge is learning the language of transfer <laughs> and um, you know just making that glossary available was uh, a huge help to me and uh, I used it and referred to it often and refer other people to it. So that was another a great initiative that you've already um, undertaken and I just wanted to, to thank you for that. So uh, this is Richard. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of uh, ONCAT's sister organization, HECO. Um, and one of the things that they do is provide um, kind of white papers. Um, and well, I, I'm not sure that we necessarily need something that, that is, is quite as elaborate as that. It seems to me that some of the things that have come out today um, have been um, you know, the results of, of, of people's research along the lines of, well, how do uh, college students fare when they get to university? Um, what, what are the benefits and, um, you know, to the institution and, uh, and to faculty members individually um, of the uh, greater diversity and, and mixture of backgrounds of their students, th those kinds of things. So um, I wonder if a sort of series of fact sheets or something like that might be something that could be collected from the um, ONCAT fellows um, and other projects funded by ONCAT um, to help uh, answer some of these common questions. Yeah, in that sense, sharing data between uh, participating universities and getting a larger shared database might might be something someone could work on for sure. Okay. Um, we have a few more minutes still left. Are there other questions from the audience? Um, this is Melinda Chang from ONCAT. I'm the data analyst here. Um, as part of your uh, research to uh, uh, before going out and start engaging with the faculty, uh, do you? I just would like to understand uh, from your perspective, um, is it difficult for you to find out what your existing agreements are and, and how do you go about gathering that fact? Um, here at the University of Ottawa, it's managed uh, by our senior academic policy officer. So she's the main contact person and she is the one who kind of has the record of all of the existing agreements. Um, what I found harder to track down was information about the students, um, uh, you know, how many transfer students there are, um, which programs they're in, uh, what's their completion rate, that sort of thing. Um, I think the data is here, but it it's not maybe compiled in a sort of way that makes it easy to just kind of, you know, scoop in and grab it. Um, but certainly the information about the agreements themselves, I, I didn't have any trouble locating that. Yeah, in my case, uh, um, the existing agreements, um, I don't even know where they are, to be, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, I think that my helper uh, knows, and also the deputy provost certainly has access to that, but for whatever reason, I, I never needed to really look at the full list of agreements. Uh, I was just more looking at uh, places that could be helped, and then they'd tell me whether or not the agreement was already there, or whether or not there was work to be done, or whether the agreement wasn't very good, or and whatnot. Uh, in terms of the, the data about flows between institutions, uh, yes, that's the trouble. So everything had to be collected uh, manually and just basically going through uh, uh, transcripts manually and uh, trying to figure out um, uh, where the student was. So this is all manually done by this fellow, uh, Andrew Hepner, which again underlines the importance of having a dedicated person to do that because there's no chance I could, I'd be able to do that. You know, uh, that would, that's like a full-time research project job. Uh, so we, we I feel like it 
could be integrated into the um, institutional research and planning office, but they would just need some guidelines and, and sort of, you know, like look for this, gather this as it comes in. I think they just don't, they're not, they just don't think to look for it at the moment. They've never been asked to look for it. So that could I well think be it true, probably yeah. could be systematized, but it, it hasn't been yet, not here anyway. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll ask a, um, just a quick question in that case. Um, in, in your experience, Lynn and Tony, um, have you, ha has there been any consideration of transfers the other direction out of the university programs and into the colleges? That, uh, that, that's a rather more bi-directional sort of question. But I wonder if uh, in part of these articulation agreements they, they include that kind of transfer as well. Uh, well, when I started, I was almost more passionate about that direction, about university to college, um, only because sometimes, in the, especially in the arts and social sciences, the student will uh, get a degree but not have performed great, find out through the degree that they're not, you know, totally academically minded and university might not be the right choice, but they're still able to get the degree. Um, but the trouble is, if you have a 65% uh, average in um, uh, philosophy, let's say, um, the world's not really opening its doors to you much. So your choices um, become difficult at that time in terms of the traditional university pathway. So that's when much more applied concrete skill sets can be invaluable. And I often encourage my students to... Uh, to go to Humber College or places like that where they've got uh, postgraduate uh, degree programs where you have to have a university degree in order to be eligible to apply. Um, and so these these programs are probably quite favorably looked upon. My sister did that, actually. I always tell my students about my sister who dropped out of university but went to, uh, got into one of these, well, she dropped out of her master's degree and got into one of these postgraduate college programs while well, I went and did my PhD and she's retired at 42 and I'm still uh, you know plugging away here and probably will be until I'm a lot older than 42 so you know there's a lot of good opportunity uh, in terms of that direction I think on the college side one of the challenges is building programs like that that if you have a degree in university we're going to give you this other class of, uh, of training that um, is sort of recognized in a different way maybe than some of the standard programs, and that would be helpful. Not all of the colleges have that, and not in a robust way. And the other thing is obviously just standard transfer agreements that X number of uh, courses in the university uh, are, are obtainable. But, yeah, I always saw it as almost more valuable to have transfers in the other direction. But, of course, the university administration is more interested in having um, getting business rather than giving business. So uh, there's always that tension there, too. Yeah, it would be similar here. Um, I'm not aware of any agreements that have been set up from the university to the college direction. Um, certainly, um, there's room, I would say, to explore that particular direction. It seems a little bit underserved in comparison to the college to university transfer. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, Maybe I'll just summarize briefly what I, I thought were the, the five main points that came out of the conversation, uh, although two of them are related. Um, the first one was that uh, the need to build awareness amongst our faculty colleagues um, of the what, how, and why of uh, transfers, um, and related to that, um, the une unevenness of knowledge and the unevenness of treating of students. Um, between different programs and, uh, and uh, different uh, transfers between different institutions and so on. Um, and related to that, um, the importance of data, both for the performance of students and for convincing our colleagues that that performance is good, um, and for recruiting of students into uh, transfer programs. Uh, I saw that the theme of um, a kind of balance of, of faculty workload versus um, pet projects. So, so we needed more than one uh, champion at an institution, but that had to be offset by the workload um, of, uh, of uh, transfer processes. 
Uh, and lastly, under the category of uh, support, uh, we had um, not only tangible support of dedicated people to help on this, but uh, moral support in, uh, um, for, for the people involved, uh, support for coordination of academic, uh, academic coordination uh, across the institution from um, the uh, more senior academic leadership, Support for students uh, who are in, who are um, in the transfer um, um, process, uh, and in terms of a repository of information, uh, both in terms of agreements being made, but also uh, the results of research that has gone on through OnCat and, and elsewhere. So um, that said, I would like to thank uh, Lynn and Tony very much for participating in the. In the panel and for ONCAT and particular Sarah uh, for her organization uh, and to thanks thank the uh, audience um, for listening in um, and to remind you that on May 28th next week at 11 a.m. there is a similar panel um, of uh, college ONCAT fellows um, uh, being convened uh, by teleconference again um, to which I'm sure you're all invited to attend. Uh, any last minute words uh, Sarah? Um, yeah, and thank you so much for that reminder about the, the college panel. Next week we're, we're super excited about that. Um, and, you know, it's clear from today's discussion that there's a lot more to be said and explored, and ONCAT is really looking forward to keeping the momentum going on faculty engagement in the transfer conversation. Um, and so stay tuned because we'll be sharing uh, the project learnings from this year's faculty fellows um, over the summer. and. Uh, We'll, we'll try to kind of uh, feed that out to the sector. So thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today.